Hello, this is Hot Indonesia, and welcome to all of you watching us in Surabaya. I'm Dalton Tanaraka in Jakarta, and here is this week's HI Hot List. Turning point. Cases are down. Vaccine doses are up. Are we beating the second wave of COVID-19? We ask. Dr. Didit Setiobudi of the Jakarta Police. Language limbo, why some are saying that learning Chinese is being blocked by politics. And boob tube, aren't we past censoring Baywatch bodies? Here are my co-host, Sandrina Malakiano, is home from her travels in the U.S., now in COVID quarantine in Jakarta, and Millie Lukito, CEO of the Mobiliati Group, from her home in Jakarta. Hot topic number one, turning point. The number of new daily cases of COVID-19 in this country have dropped dramatically from as high as 50,000 a few months ago to below 10,000 this week. As a result, the president downgraded the emergency level in many parts of the country. The government says that's due to the near lockdown for the past two months. Ladies, you know, if we did this last last year, which we called for, or at least earlier this year, we might be opening up a lot faster as they did in the U.S., right, Sandrina? So let me ask you first, uh, Global Traveler, are we finally at the turning point in this pandemic fight? Um, I'm not uh, really sure we are. Uh, hope, of course, we hope we are, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, you know, the, as you mentioned, we have called for this since the very beginning and the government shouldn't have hesitated um, since the beginning of the pandemic to uh, enforce strict regulations, restrictions, uh, measures uh, to deal with the pandemic. Uh, while of course uh, we needed also the government to have prepared a proper and adequate social safety net for all the people uh, hit by the pandemic, uh, including in the form of um, direct social aid. Uh, in dealing with this COVID-19, our government should have played a major, major role, become a leader of uh, the crisis management center, Dalton. Uh, should, they should have acted fast, uh, focused with de detailed uh, calculation uh, on the risks of public policies issued by the government. When the first wave uh, of the pandemic hit us, actions and policies did not use this approach. Uh, policies and regulations were not made uh, based on crisis management logic or approaches. So that's why everything became so ineffective, uh, um, so not sufficient enough. We could say uh, we were trapped amidst a dreadful first wave of COVID storm uh, way longer than many other countries. You know, the other big reason for lower uh, case counts, of course, vaccinations. We stayed at only 5% of the population getting their uh, shots to now near 13%. But Millie, we still have a long way to go to get people protected. Yes, uh, and the pandemic is uh, far from over. Uh, the threat is still here. And, it, you know, we have to really mitigate the risk of the upcoming holidays, uh, year-end holidays. And I'm yet to see the government uh, policies on how to prevent uh, another infection, level of infection after the holidays. So we are not, we are not over the threat yet, Dalton. But we are, we are as far along in recovery as we've ever been. And so, as you always say, Millie, we take the positive from this. Um, but Indonesians are still dying more than they should. Our fatality rate has been among the highest in the world. Um, is government doing enough? We ask Dr. Didit Setiobudi. He coordinates the vaccination program of the Jakarta Police. He joins us now. Um, Dr. Didit, thank you for joining us. Why is vaccination going so slowly compared to other countries here? And what specifically are police doing to help? We are not slow. Let us all understand the basic situation first. The size of our population, the availability of vaccine, the challenges in logistic and distribution of vaccine. Indonesia is one of the earliest country in the world to start public vaccination for COVID-19. That is a fact. Our efforts are always based on data and thanks to Bapak Kapolda Metro Jaya, the head of Greater Jakarta Police, for having the idea for the Vaksinasi Merdeka program. Utilizing the police force, we built approximately 600 vaccination centers across 900 sectors in Jakarta. People 
can get the vaccine easily, literally in front of their doors. The result was instant from August 1st to 17. We surpassed the target given by the president that's almost 2 million people vaccinated. Uh, Sandrina, question for Dr. Didit. Yes, uh, Dr. Didit, uh, thank you. I personally have, have had uh, experience uh, with a, the very uh, useful, simple, and uh, easy to access vaccination program provided by the, the Indonesian police, both in Jakarta as well as in Bali. But we know that not all regions uh, in Indonesia have this very high target and massive vaccination program as in those two cities, Jakarta and then Pasar, for example, in Bali. My question is, uh, could you tell us how, how the police are coordinating with maybe the health department or other uh, institutions in order to boost the vaccination program throughout Indonesia? The key word is collaboration, central and local government. Ministries, police, military, private sectors. Everybody has to work together to combat COVID-19 and to boost vaccination. Coordination between all related parties is well understood by everyone and is currently at operation level very harmonious. Sharing is key. Sharing of data, sharing of resources, sharing of supply. Millie, question? What can you say to people who are hesitating to get their shots? Education and socialization are the keys. In fact, the problem is not confined to Indonesia alone. It is a global problem. Indonesia police force will continue to educate people, making a special effort to stop any spread of false information and hoaxes. Vaccines are safe and halal. It is proven that vaccination reduces hospitalization. Vaccination is key in our effort to fight COVID-19. Dr. Didit Setiobudi of the Jakarta Police, thank you very much for your time. Hot Indo will continue shortly. Language limbo is learning Mandarin not as easy as it should be. Every week in this program, I will introduce you to one of Indonesia's fabulous food items. Mmm, yummy. Beautiful. Now, I'm ready to cook. Let's go to the kitchen. It's done. Let's meet to eat. Foodipedia on the Indonesia Channel. Trần Minh Ngân ở VCCNet Việt in Hanoi. I'm Thái Rat Thong Ya of Thailand's Thái Rat TV in Bangkok. I'm Monica Samboret from the National Television of Cambodia in Phnom Penh. I'm Raymond Go of Malaysia's TV Tiga in Kuala Lumpur. I'm Glenda Chong of Singapore's Channel News Asia. I'm Marissa Chantami of the Indonesia Channel at the ASEAN Secretariat in Jakarta. This is your weekly look into the dynamic Southeast Asia region. ASEAN Today on the Indonesia Channel. 
You are watching Hot Indonesia with Sandrina, Millie, and me. Here's hot topic number two, language limbo. China is Indonesia's number one trading partner and biggest investor, so learning Mandarin makes business sense. But in an opinion piece in the Jakarta Post, lecturer Mohamed Zulfikar Rahmat says language proficiency isn't happening here due to political reasons. He points to the new order policies of former President Suharto, who shut down Chinese schools and forced family name changes, all of which have since been reversed. Millie, um... You read the article, uh, is the scholar right? Are there lingering effects of anti-Chinese sentiment in Indonesia today? No, uh, the Indonesia today ha is already very different. Uh, we are already very open and we have embraced China, uh, not uh, like before, uh, historically. But let me tell you, Dalton, the language, the Mandarin language is very difficult language, very difficult to master. And the level of difficulty of Mandarin language is at least three times harder than uh, English. Yeah, you're, you're, you're taking lessons right now, right? Even though you're, you're ethnic Chinese, why, why are you doing it? Yeah, because it makes, uh, again, like you said, it makes uh, business sense. And also during the pandemic, rather than not doing anything, I decided to take up a new language. As the most, and the most challenging language in the world today is, I think, Chinese, because it has a very distinctive characters, the Hanse characters, and um, even and it's it's a very detailed language. Like I said, three times harder than uh, English, and you we can still see not many Indonesians uh, speak English well. So uh, it it is one of a most challenging language around. I will say. Okay, but the point of the piece I think was not the difficulty, and that's why people aren't learning it, but perhaps a, a, a problem of a lack of government support or encouragement, um, Sandrina, in learning Mandarin or perhaps uh, in Chinese culture, embracing it in general? Now, first of all, Dalton, way to go, Millie. Whoa. I would say it's not three times harder than English, just maybe 10 or 15 <laughs> times harder than English. Wow, you're learning Mandarin, that's, that's really cool. Uh, Dalton, to answer your question, uh, as you mentioned uh, in the beginning of this segment, since Abdurrahman Wahid or Gus Dur's presidency, uh, limitations made uh, in the era of Suharto's new order uh, regime uh, have been revised. So if we can compare the situation, as Millie said, uh, during those times and, and what we are seeing right now, uh, things have changed so drastically. Um, President Habibi and Gus Dur's uh, transitional initiatives since the beginning of the Reformation era uh, has made that limitations on the growth of the Chinese culture, including the use of its language, no longer exist. So why isn't man Mandarin like more popular in Indonesia? Is it lack uh, due to the lack of support or encouragement from the government, as you asked me? Uh, well, I personally am of the opinion that Indonesia has never had a grand design when it comes to uh, education, especially the use or education of foreign languages in Indonesia. Not only since the Suharto era, but even now, nothing has changed. Um, we've been in the Reformation era for 23 years. Um, well, some people might say or disagree that don't well, we have uh, students learning uh, foreign languages because it's in the curriculum from elementary school until university. But they focus more on the grammar, not mastering uh, the language alone. So that is just not enough, especially with our current national curriculum and uh, inadequate human resources, foreign language teachers. Uh, it's, it's a long way to go. One thing that's really important is that even though we should encourage our students or the young generation, everybody to master foreign languages, the fact is here, ironically, even the young generation, they do not speak proper Bahasa Indonesia, Dalton. <laughs> do you realize yeah. that now uh, their gen our generation, the younger generations, they speak English better than Bahasa Indonesia. This should not happen. Or at least equal to their, their proficiency in the native language. Um, Millie, you know, I'm not talking about just the 
ethnic Chinese learning Mandarin, which is, you know, families want their kids and their grandkids to do that for a part of their culture. But uh, we're talking about the population in, in general, um, right? I mean, it's, you're, you're, we're, how many Chinese, ethnic Chinese in this country? About 7%, not a very big percentage. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge for people of all races here. Yes. Uh, but not only the ethnic Chinese nowadays, uh, people of all races in Indonesia, they have taken up Mandarin language. But it's just, again, like Sandrina said, it is a very difficult language to master. And I can assure you that there is nothing political about it. It's just because it is, number one, very difficult. And then not enough resources, not enough teachers out there. And uh, also universities providing uh, Chinese language. Uh, but having said that, there is a fast growth of Chinese speakers now in Indonesia of all ethnic groups uh, throughout Indonesia, which is very heartening to know. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot more Chinese programming coming in via streaming and, and uh, TV, uh, which helps people learn. And, and I learn through like karaoke sometimes. Um, last point, Sandrina, you know, I've lo long encouraged young people to learn Chinese. Um, if they asked me what uh, my opinion was about learning a second language, what would your advice be to students and business people, Sandrina, real quickly? Uh, you know, the strength of one's, uh, na one country's national language uh, to become a global language is always closely related to the, the economic and political strength of that country. Since uh, China underwent uh, the reformation process and became a communist country with a capitalist face, China transformed into this global power. And Indonesia is also an emerging global power. I believe Indonesia will be a very strong country economically and politically. So uh, now we know that uh, the younger generation, they are already like uh, a lot better in terms of mastering uh, foreign languages, especially English. But, uh, you know, language is such an important as, uh, asset. If you want to excel, if you want to have a good career, you have to master at least one or two uh, foreign languages. Of course, after mastering the Bahasa Indonesia properly. But yes, English, uh, Mandarin, maybe one from the uh, eastern part of the country. Uh, either maybe uh, French or Italian or Spanish. It's like from one uh, language group. You know, it's so easy now to learn languages because we are living on an internet-based uh, and social media-based world now. So people have uh, easy access. Okay, easy access, but the, the language remains difficult to learn. I barely, I ba I barely master English. Um, okay, more hot Indo is ahead. <laughs> Boob tube, do we really need to blur certain parts of TV bodies? Welcome to Yoga Bliss. Dropping your hands to the mat, just step it back and out and up to the side. Up through your fingertips. Reach your right hand back behind your head. Let your hands separate forward and then start. Yoga Bliss, only on the Indonesia Channel.
and you are watching IVA Playlist. Perasaan rasa cinta aku persembahkan untukmu di dalam bubuk hatiku. Tolong lihat aku dan jawab pertanyaanku. Ditunggu aku bagaimana dengan pacarku. Denganmu, ku tamukan cahaya hati. iPop on the Indonesia Channel. You're watching Hot Indonesia from Jakarta. Hot topic number three: boob tube. When a local TV station aired the movie Baywatch last month, it's an old movie. The Indonesian Broadcast Commission, the KPI, responded with a warning, saying it was inappropriate because it showed quote. Thighs, breasts, and buttocks. Previous censorship includes athletes in swimsuits and Sandy the squirrel in SpongeBob SquarePants. And I kid you not, I guess Sandy had a pretty hot bikini on. Um, okay, ladies, I understand the religious aspects of modesty in this country, but in some cases, Sandrina, the KPI goes too far. Uh, Dalton, I'm not against censorship. I am against censorship that make no sense. And um, what we need is a form of uh, freedom with boundaries based on responsibility. Kebebasan yang bertanggung jawab. That's how I, I would put it. But as you mentioned, KPI sometimes, they just go way beyond, uh, make groundless uh, restrictions or actions. For example, um, do you remember in the 2016 uh, Pekan Olahraga Nasional or the uh, National Sports Week, KPI demanded or requested that all female swimmers, uh, their bodies must be blurred. Um, that is so weird. I yeah, mean, yeah. I mentioned athletes and swimmers. They did allow it in the Olympics, though. And yeah. And the reason, if the reason behind that is uh, like religious considerations in terms of aurat, men also have aurat. That means starting from the upper body until their knees. So why the double standard? And still doesn't make sense. You want to blur that too? I mean, <laughs> you remember Farah Queen was also once uh, censored by KPI because they said, she uh, showed too much cleavage. Well, Farah Quinn, if, uh, for people outside this country, a, a so-called celebrity chef you know, who, um, yeah. yeah. She's a celebrity yeah. chef, very well known, and she's yeah. good. Millie, you know, we're, I was told movies and TV shows like 20 years ago were even sexier. I mean, I think we ran a classic movie here on TIC recently, which a famous actress was swimming nude. Um, actually, I mean, you couldn't see it, but it was her back. Uh, what changed? Those were the days. Those were the beautiful days. <laughs> <laughs> and then we are now faced with this uh, a government, bo government body that has nothing better to do. I think wasting taxpayers' money. And like Sandrina said, nobody now uh, watch television through the, through the old ways. You know, everybody is in the internet. And uh, we can see all you know all kinds of shows nowadays okay so what happened did we go to the right we we took a turn toward conservatism here i don't know like i said it's a waste of taxpayers money and there is no grounds uh, there is no not clear uh, rules uh, of why they do uh, certain things and they also do not have again a, like the grand strategy you know of television in indonesia what impact uh, all these communication strategies have, they just do things uh, ineffectively. Ineffectively. Thank okay. you. Know, and, you know, and, one, no, and one, one last point, we got to move on, is Sandy the Squirrel is a cartoon character <laughs> if you don't watch SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants, which I do. I like it. Okay, feedback time. Bespi in the Philippines posted this on our YouTube page. Beautiful young women will marry a not so good looking guy if money is unlimited. But money can't buy you love, Bespi. Also from YouTube, this comment from Roy. 
praying for the people of Afghanistan. Here's how to contact us with your feedback. Email at hotindo at theindonesiachannel.com or comment through our Hot Indonesia or Indonesia Channel Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. Final words, Sandrina. One important matter that I learned uh, from my trip uh, with my family to the United States is the fact that it is so, so easy to get vaccinated that any form of vaccination, especially the COVID-19 uh, vaccination, be that Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson, um, anyone, including foreign uh, citizens who live there or people who are just there to visit, could get uh, very easily access to the vaccination. Uh, all they need to do is go to a public facility, supermarkets, or maybe a pharmacy, uh, fill in a registration form, show a valid ID, and then you get your vaccination. Uh, so fast, simple, and free. You know, I believe Indonesia could also provide such an effective and easy uh, vaccination program to the people. The government must change all those complicated procedures and requirements and make it as simple as possible, easy as possible for the people. You know, we can overcome this problem together and beat this pandemic. Final words, Millie. End of the year is uh, coming up soon. And I'm very concerned of uh, the impact it will have on people who are, although vaccinated, but uh, going to be even more mobile during the holidays. And I'm actually concerned because the government has not come up with a very clear strategy on how to mitigate another, like a third infection uh, rise in Indonesia. So stay safe and uh, I'm praying for the best. And my final words, my first working visit to Indonesia came exactly 20 years ago. My assignment was to interview the owners or the owner of Indonesia's first TV news channel for my CNN International talk show. I came, I saw, and not long after, I would return, and I am still here, enjoying the people in many aspects of life that are not all perfect, but provide challenges that keep me motivated. And that is Hot Indonesia for this week. For Sandrina Malakiano and Millie Lukito, I'm Dalton Tanaraka. Thank you very much for watching. Please join us again next time. Yeah.